understand this current trend um, in the US of mimicking the Australian no. No. How they, we... they all think that we say no with like an R on the end. No. 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 <laughs> no. <laughs> I think it's about time we started making fun of the um, North American no. It's so round. No. 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 No, you cannot come in here. No, no please go away. You cannot. Hello, humans. My name is Dale Kingsmill, and today here with me is the wonderful Ben Byrne, who you might know from the Eldridge Lawcast that we do together once a week. Once every week. Ben Byrne has been making some uh, wonderful DM sort of advisory creative inspiration videos over on the uh, Ghostfire Gaming YouTube channel. Why, why, why should we squander this opportunity? Let's get together two Aussie DMs and make the ultimate Australian D&D &D setting. I know that we've got some critters to share, we've got some some items, some item goodies, and I certainly have some uh, some locations that I would like to share Ooh. with you today. Okay, well I'm, I'm gonna very excited. add to that. I've got uh, at least one, possibly two player races as well, <gasps> unique Australian uh, player races. Thank and you. a spell. I had one, there was one reference and this is the super obscure you reference. Us. Bell? Well, I didn't originally I was gonna make it a creature then I thought I'd make it a magic item and then I ended up making it a spell and it's kind of all of those things at once but mechanically it's a spell. The spell pipeline. Yeah, 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 exactly. I would like to share with you possibly my simplest and most elegant creature, the aeroplane jelly. <laughs> <laughs> Real easy to explain. It's just an ochre jelly, but it can fly. Great. Love it. Somehow, like, terrifying as well, you know? Just this thing <laughs> kind of dropping down from the sky, which I feel like is a theme of, of Australia, yeah. things dropping down from above. <laughs> I also, uh, maybe ochre jelly isn't the right term, because I feel like it has to be bright green or bright red. Those are the only two colours that it can come in. I feel like the Witcher-style quest for this, when the, when the party I go and... I believe you got the Witcher Yeah, already in there. That's, that's, just how I, that's just how I operate, Dale. The, the party arrive in a village... And a little girl's gone missing and their parent says, oh, they, they were last seen on the playground. And they go there and it's like a swing set with the chain hanging down. And it's just like there's no seat. There's no swing seat. It's just burned away and has been like dissolved uh, because that's where the aeroplane jelly landed. Folks that don't get the reference, the ad had a little girl on a swing set <laughs> singing I love aeroplane jelly. Well, aeroplane jelly. Jelly loved her may she rest in peace <laughs> horrifying i love it big fan sticking on the creature theme for the moment uh i have the huntsman spider which when i was younger the huntsman spider is sort of one of australia's more infamous spiders because it's huge it's terrifying it's actually not that dangerous though the reason it's called the huntsman is not because it hunts men which is what I thought when I was younger, but because it like, it doesn't spin a web, it kind of runs up on things and like, like a hunter and like hits them, oh, you know, that's how it hunts I like beetles. Did you not know that? There you go. Oh, um, that's horrible. Yes. Yeah. Basically this is a giant spider, but I've slightly adjusted the stat block. It's got a movement speed of 50 feet, so it can really run up on something. Um, it's hit points. I've just put lots. It's got dark vision. It's got blind sight. It has basically just give a giant spider the draconic trait, a uh, frightening presence so that as soon as anybody sees it, they have to make a save or become frightened. Um, and that's the experience of finding a huntsman in your house. As soon as I see one, wherever it is, usually up on the ceiling, my gut just drops and I'm like, oh no, now I've got to deal with this monster in my house for a little bit of added fun with the experience of Huntsman's, there is uh, an extra trait called Mutation, because no two Huntsman's are the same in my experience. Mutation will basically add either a hardened shell, which will give it a higher armor class, because I swear I once saw a Huntsman that looked more like a crab. You're right, I've seen them, they're real. Right, thank you, I didn't imagine yeah. it when I was 10 years old. That thing was scary. Another version, po uh, Potent Venom, which will cause like incapacitation. And then of course, the way that Huntsman's hunt, because they're hunters, it's in the name, is camo. <laughs> So give them advantage on stealth checks if they're in sort of maybe like a foresty or, or keeping with the Australian uh, uh, theme, a bush like region. Oh, that's what we should have done was a circle of the of the outback or circle of the bush or something circle like that. Circle of the bush. Yeah, for the druid. Uh, I'm going to leap to items for a minute. First of all, boomerangs. You got to have boomerangs. Technically, I think the boomerang did exist within the sort of um, basic rules, but it kind of disappeared after that. 
Yeah, I can't And my remember. boomerang's better. So, um, you know, light, ranged, thrown, 1d4, uh, you know, short range, 60 feet, long range, 100 feet. Sure. Immediately after the attack, the weapon flies back to your head. That's it. That's all it is. But also I have here uh, <laughs> the magic pudding. Yes! Which, of course... <laughs> That's my spell! I'm sorry. All right, we both have a version oh, no! of this. Oh, no, wait. Oh, this is... Okay. We both well, have now, a magic pudding uh, uh, variant. All right. Yours is going to be better because mine is literally just magic pudding, sentient pudding. <laughs> its name is Albert. It never runs out no matter how much you eat it. Okay. But it will constantly attempt to run away. <laughs> oh, great. See, I, I, I went a little bit more um, a little bit more complex uh, with uh, Magic putting a fourth level conjuration spell, um, which has a casting time of 10 minutes. And it's basically like somewhere between Hero's Feast and Goodberry. My favorite of... spell, Goodberry. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? I mean, to be fair- Go watch the Eldritch Law cast. The idea is that you spend 10 minutes, you, you create a pudding. Um, the pudding has four slices. Um, the, every time, every time somebody consumes a slice of the pudding, they get a D8 of hit points and they can end a condition on themselves being like frightened, blinded, poisoned, that sort of thing. Uh, you can regenerate the pudding by using spell slots, uh, up to the number of slices of pudding you want to regenerate, but you need to have at least one slice left and there can only be four slices max. So like if you, if you eat three slices you can use a second level spell slot to get two slices back and it basically never runs out if you don't eat that final slice it'll keep coming back but there is a See, seventh good. level uh if you cast the spell at seventh level then the magic pudding becomes a permanent magic item that just regenerates itself every 24 hours um so that you can continue eating it i wrote a little bit of lore for this oh please uh which is that magic puddings are coveted magic items for their deliciousness their healing properties, and their potential to self-regenerate if created by a powerful mage. Bards and wizards who learn to conjure magic puddings stand to make a fortune if they open their own bakery. However, magic puddings come with their own risks as pudding thieves will stop at nothing to claim a magic pudding for themselves with a little suggestion to use. I think ideally the master thief stat block, but that's not in the, the SRD. So the, the assassin stat block for putting thieves. Okay, let's see. What else do I got here? One battering rams. <laughs> okay. <laughs> which I like to imagine as being like just a really big wombat, but kind of with like sheep horns. <laughs> gotcha. The stat block is remarkably similar to that of a bullet, <laughs> but you replace it. You know, bullets have all that sort of leaping stuff. Replace that with a crushing attack. Okay. So basically I've got... When the one battering ram is within five feet of a hostile creature who is within five feet of a wall, it can make a crushing attack and the target has to make a dexterity saving throw or it takes a 3d10 plus four bludgeoning damage. It's not a small amount. And is amount. restrained and is restrained uh, on a failed save. It takes half as much damage and isn't restrained on a successful save, obviously. And of course, the target is no longer restrained if the one, ba the one, the one battering ram moves. Why is it so hard to say one battering ram? <laughs> I think this was just inspired by one too many stories from my hometown about, oh no, the dog's gotten into a wombat hole. We yeah. have to get it out. You That's just... the defense mechanism. They will run into their burrow and anything that's chasing them to eat them, they'll they'll deliberately like drop their butt down so that they can kind of get in above the butt mm. and then they'll crush them against the ceiling yeah, of well. the burrow. I didn't know they were that dangerous. A wombat's like, are they the hippopotamus of Australia? Like this <gasps> un, unassuming, undangerous looking animal. You're like, oh, that's look actually at it. super so deadly. Cute. And like, and then it comes in and it kills your dog. We'll Nothing's kill you. cute and cuddly. <laughs> yeah. Everything will kill you. I have a couple of other creatures. Where my my mind kept going was to like um, familiars. Initially, I was thinking of like a monstrous kookaburra, um, kind of like a giant owl. But then I was like, no, what if you had a kookaburra, which for people that don't know is kind of, uh, it's a little... It's a bird. Uh, what to, um... it's, it's like, it's a kingfisher bird. Yes. That laughs mm -hmm. like a person. Exactly. <laughs> it's bizarre. And so I thought if you uh, if you have a kookaburra as a familiar, once per day you can cast uh, Tasha's Hideous Laughter. <laughs> a sugar glider, which is kind of like a possum um, that can glide. Basically like 
the wing suit that Batman wears. If you've seen anybody in a paraglider suit, they're based basically on sugar gliders or they look very similar. Sugar glider gives you feather fall uh, if you have it as a familiar. I just really love familiars that give you a little something something. Yes. Just a little, just a little sprinkling of like, hey, that's your familiar, so you get this. I really like that kind of um, individuality. I just remembered the uh, magpie familiar. <gasps> I hate magpies. Magpies will come after you. They swoop when they're in season during spring. Maybe a magpie familiar that allows you to once per day cast cause fear because like as soon as they swoop you it's just the worst thing in the world. It's true. Like, you know what we should have is some kind of a magic item that is the equivalent of an ice cream container with eyes drawn on the back of yeah. it. <laughs> Alright this is possibly my my worst punning. So, um, Mighty Veg, in place of Veggie Might, Mighty Veg, once per day a character can uh, eat some Mighty Veg mm -hmm. and make a DC 15 constitution save. <laughs> On a success, their strength score increases by one. Okay. Huge. On a failure, they return to their original strength score and they're poisoned. <laughs> Okay. And of course, every day that the character does not eat Mighty Veg, their strength score decreases by one until it's returned to normal. But the idea is that uh, our mummy says we're growing stronger every single week. Yeah. Because we love our Vegemite. We all enjoy our Vegemite. It was a rise in every Don't make anything out of Vegemite. There's a Vegemite ice cream. Oh, terrible. All right, I'm going to go play a race. The Kangen. Uh, incredibly originally named. They kind of look humanoid. See, this is where I'm, I'm not sure what they look like. I, I need like an artist's interpretation. Somewhere between like a human and like just a kangaroo, like where in the middle exactly they fit. You can of course Tasha's this if you prefer with the floating ability scores, but I gave it um, plus two to strength, plus one to dex. They can get up to about seven feet tall if they stand on their tail, which kangaroos can do. Uh, walking speed, 40 feet. Uh, so they're pretty fast. Proficiency with athlet athletics. Keen senses. Uh, so they have perception as a as a skill and they also have advantage on perception checks that rely on hearing. Here's where we get into the more kangaroo stuff. So I gave them kangaroo hop and I maybe thought too much mechanically about how this was going to work for the tone of this video. 5e is like weirdly specific about like long jump and high jump and, and the differences between uh, your powerful legs give you the ability to hop large distances. You double the distance for your long jump. Um, so whether you're standing or you get that 10 foot run up, you double the distance. When calculating your high jump distance, you use a distance equal to three times your strength modifier Ooh. instead of three plus your strength modifier. Kangaroos have a reputation as being boxers, as being melee combatants. So I gave the kangaroo the ability, I call it a powerful boxer, because basically what they do is when they're in a fight, they can jump back onto their tail entirely so it supports them <sighs> yes. and then they use it to spring forward um, uh, with their with their feet. So uh, you can use the tail to support you during combat uh, and act as a powerful spring to thrust you towards your foes. When making a melee weapon attack you can choose to deal an additional 1d8 of the weapon's damage. You can use this ability a number of times equal to your strength modifier and regain the ability to do so when you finish a long rest. Kangan make great paladins, fighters, barbarians, monks. I live in fear of a Kangan monk, yeah. Yeah, right? Ah, actually that's peak. Yeah, that's peak. Peak Kangan. This is, okay, welcome to Cooper's Pity. From the surface, the, the tiny dot that's marked on the map, it says it's Cooper's Pity, but you know, you look out and it basically is nothing more than a stretch of like flat, <laughs> pale desert. Cool. Uh, there is a sign, the Y has fallen off or more likely probably been stolen to change the place's name to Cooper's Pit. And, and I like to think that the entrance kind of, it basically looks like a Sarlacc pit from Star Wars, but without the teeth. You just have to climb down into this big hole. And then once you're in there, uh, you enter you enter the, the sort of mine and town proper with its, you know, t tight maze-like corridors, wide lamplit pavilions, and ever descending staircases, all roughly hewn from ivory stone with lightning strikes of oak streaking in branches of high vis blues and purples. People familiar with my channel uh, <laughs> know that I like to flesh out locations using a certain acronym, sperm. I have heard this. Social, political, economic, religious, and military. Uh, I like to emphasize some over others. For Cooper's Pity, I've, I've emphasized um, 
social and religious, I think, because I think that they've got some interesting stuff. So political, I think it'll be fun if there's like union elections going on <laughs> uh, when the players get there for the miners. I've got sort of, you know, economic is pretty simple because clearly they are, you know, concerned with jewelry smithing and gem mining. Um, I do have a little note here for an interesting item and NPC that is maybe a deep cut, but it's um, an opal necklace. <laughs> that contains a genie <laughs> and his adolescent son. Genie, genie from down under. A seminal classic. And let me tell you this much. I used to have nightmares about genie from, from down under. Really? I was more terrified of around the twist. I feel like the lighthouse That's from legit. around the That's twist. Fair. The clown episode in particular. Was it a, no, it was a scarecrow. They dressed the scarecrow in the clown clothes. <laughs> Go back and look at it. It's on YouTube and it is. No, horrific. no. No, I don't want to. <laughs> it's not okay. No, it's not. The military aspect is just that I think that the, the mines themselves are patrolled by armored one battering rams with their guards to enforce sort of a curfew that keeps everyone in the city proper at night so no one's in there stealing steal in the gems. Mm. Those are the, the sort of uh, brushed over things, but I also like to think that as a social element, um, the, it's, they've got dwarven sort of working choirs who they, you know, they hold a Steadfords. There's a, there's sort of a, a big singing culture and you can sort of always hear these sort of resonating harmonies floating up through the minds of, of the, the miners as they're singing. Um, and I like to think that there would be sort of a call and response Song for the Lost to, to help find people a little bit in, in the vein of, let me get away from the microphone. <laughs> and I, I thought maybe an NPC who's the ghost of a vagabond who wanders through the mines singing to draw people away from safety. You know, you yeah. might call him a jolly swagman, even if you wanted to. And then finally, this one's a little bit less Australian. I just think it's neat as a plot hook. I think it'd be cool if there's like a dragon cult. <laughs> <laughs> and they're, they're in the mines because they're digging to find an ancient sleeping gemstone dragon, an opal dragon. Gotcha. Uh, deep, deep in the, this is a phrase I stole, the down under dark. And I think a cool NPC attached to that would be like the leader of the cult could be just a, a warlock and the opal dragon is their patron. I think that adds, you know, a nice, a nice little plot hook of sort of mystery and intrigue to, to the mining town of Cooper's Pity. I love the idea that you um, roam through the Underdark and you know you've entered the down Underdark when everybody starts with the Australian accents, you know? It's just, uh, you slowly, as you, you're moving through eventually, like, ah, oh, we've gone too far. And then you come up <laughs> into uh, uh, Cooper's Pity um, and realize you've arrived in this uh, new campaign setting. It's our version of the Barovian Mists. I feel oh, like uh, we need a Kangan NPC called Skippy. <gasps> who, True. who Maybe he's like a, a quest. He's like a retired adventurer, and now he gives yeah. quests. I did have one other player race. I did, this one's not quite complete, but there was just a thought that was making me laugh and laugh and laugh. Um, so this is the uh, koala kin. Um, intelligence score increases, dexterity, have a reputation of being wise. They live to be around 80, have a climbing speed, uh, which is equal to their walking speed. But this was the thing that was just making me laugh because I, I would have thought this was a monster, but then I thought this would be so fun as a player race. This ability is called Drop Bear. And what it does, the flavor text for it is that rumors whisper of the savagery of your kindred when catching folk unaware. It is mostly an unearned reputation. Mostly. If you have advantage on an attack roll against a creature that has not acted in combat yet, if the attack hits, it is a critical hit. And you can use this ability once and regain the ability to do so after a long rest. If you get the uh, drop on someone, uh, you can just eliminate them. Drop bears need representation. This is an important public service announcement. This is my last thing. Okay. But it is another location, so it's a little in depth. And it doesn't have a good name. If you have a good name to suggest for this, please. Okay. I've called it the Coral Rampart. 
And I don't know how I feel about it. <sighs> it's a constantly shifting sort of loose collection of settlements that have been erected on the sand banks that build up against the reef. So, you know, when that sand collects, the, as, as the current pushes and pulls, people, they, they create homes out of colorful canvas, just really simple sort of tenting that can be packed up and packed down uh, and, and sort of moved at a moment's notice. And they sort of just set up on the, the sort of the strips of pseudo land that um, come and go from different parts in the reef. So they're always moving. There's just so many shipwrecks littered up and down the reef, whether it's from attempted naval incursions uh, that the, the reef has helped defend against, uh, convicts trying to escape their coastal prisons in stolen vessels, or pirates herding merchant ships into dangerous waters. I don't know what to call this. This is another name. I had trouble naming things here. Okay. I'm calling it, it's, I said, it's home to the Great Whale, uh, which is a section of the reef where a marine geyser has formed, uh, which blasts water into the air, a la the Kayama blowhole, and it looks from a little way off like the spray from the whale's blowhole. And a hundred percent, there is absolutely rich stuff hidden in there. There's treasure. Every single movie that has ever filmed anything at the Kayama blowhole <laughs> has had treasure hidden in it. <laughs> just keeps happening. People would, the locals would be like, yeah, and just going down to the whale to look for some treasure. There be treasure. There be treasure. Social elements. Um, it's a it's a tourist hotspot, so you know there's kind of a general party atmosphere, uh, in the area. Economically, it's a tourist hotspot. The more interesting aspects that I focused on for this one were the military or military esque okay. element, were that there are two branches of of enforcement on the reef lands. There's surf patrol, who of course wear red and yellow split down the middle yeah. uh, and they're dedicated to rescuing anyone who finds themselves in trouble out in the water and uh, there are also the marine rangers who seek out anyone who's stealing or poaching from the reef yeah and i like to think that uh that these two branches of enforcement have there's like a training course that's kind of like a big rope obstacle course yeah like high up off um, the ground you have to go through yeah exactly yeah. but because they've set it up and you know the land comes and goes and disappears it's just like at any given time this could be a rope slash water course or it could be overland or it could be you know so it, it changes depending on um when you take your your particular training uh test a lot of this ended up being in the political zone um I, so you and i talked a little bit about the idea of the great white shark yes i haven't gone too far into that but i have decided i've created some npcs around that concept so i've got wildlife activist owen stave <laughs> who is here <laughs> they're trying to track and capture and rehome the great white shark yeah because it poses a threat to people but at the same time hick grinning teeth bishop vic uh hillsop was a shark hunter but is a shark i don't know he's old now okay. um so hick bishop uh is is there he's a shark hunter yeah he's a great white hunter and he'd like to become a great white shark hunter he's there trying to kill it owen stave is there trying to capture it and take it somewhere else where it won't eat people so you've got that kind of political tension and also why not i threw in that the local elected official went out swimming one morning and disappeared <laughs> The great mystery. <laughs> the great mystery. I feel like there should be a quest around that. Um, and you find out that they're actually like, they were a mer merfolk all along, just returning to their people rather than... That's huge! <laughs> I love it! I have uh, one more contribution myself, which is all, all these places, Cooper's, Petey, Pity. <laughs> not not related to a yeah. super similar. Not is related that now I'm to just any gonna place. Say the, real name. the Great Barrier Reef is uh, they need a language to share between them. Uh, so I've got two languages: Strine or Strine, Strine, which yes, is Strine, which I think is meant to be like Strayan. Strain, yeah, yeah, Strayan. Australia, mate. And that it's basically uh, the, uh, you know, common but difficult to understand for those that don't speak, read or write it. Uh, filled with inflections and cultural references that only make sense to those that speak it fluently. But then as a, as a sort of offshoot language, as a, a sort of uh, thieves can't, I have Oka. Oka is an evolved 
form of Strahd that can only be spoken and not re read or written. There's no written version of Ocker. Creatures that speak Ocker also understand both Ocker and Strahd, um, although only creatures that speak uh, Strahd can innately understand Ocker, so you can't understand Ocker if you only speak common. Creatures that only speak Ocker or mostly speak Ocker prefer not to use other languages and so charisma checks have disadvantage against a creature that prefers ochre unless you are speaking to them in ochre and or strine look at what we've we've accomplished here i'm just saying is this not the ultimate aussie setting the number one point? aussie setting in the world number you might one. say we've got places we've got items we've got creatures we've got languages we've got player races we've got you covered is what we've got Thank you so much for joining me, uh, and particularly for bringing your much stronger Australian accent to this video. I don't think I ever could do this video without um, an Australian who who has slightly more of that strain. More of the uh, the Australian inflection, yeah, mate. I thought, oh, do I get like an Akubra hat or something? Do I do I really dress up for this video? I don't have any of that. Like that's that's not me. The closest I got was my grandfather's paintings. I'll Photoshop one on. It'll be. Oh, funny. there you go. Perfect. Thank you for being here. Uh, to the people watching this video, uh, I hope that you take these gems that we've given you, these uh, rough-hewn opals from the very heart of this nation. Mm -hmm. You take them and you make them into uh, glorious, shining adventures for your players. Uh, you can find Ben and I on the Eldritch Lawcast every week. It's great. It's a lot of fun. We're there with Sean Moen and James Hake, and we always end up embroiled in all sorts of uh, design philosophies. And I think that it's it's genuinely uh, one of the highlights of my week. And of course, Ben is making videos over on uh, the Ghostfire Gaming channel. We, we do a series called Make Monsters Formidable. And the concept, the reason I use the word formidable is because the concept is meant to be both scary and mechanically dangerous. So scary and dangerous yeah. together formidable make your players fear your your big bads uh, rather than letting them just kind of be run-of-the-mill style monsters your phrase vague and evocative when i first heard that in one of your videos i was like yeah yes okay I, that that's how magic should work check out those videos over on the ghostfire gaming channel uh and uh, apart from that i do believe that's it i'm done uh email this to your grandma who loves D D and australia and i'll see you some other time farewell this is where I'd ordinarily walk off, uh, but this is where the, I'm. <laughs> yeah, that's that's it. What's the what's what's the Australian farewell? Because the Australian greeting is g'day. That's true. What's the Australian um, farewell? Have a good one. <laughs>